uh, the Cuyahoga County Public Safety and uh, Ju Justice Affairs Committee this fine December 2nd. Roll call, please. Calling the roll, Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Greenspan? Here. Mr. Germana? Here. M Mr. Harrison? Here. Ms. Conwell? Here. There is a quorum. Also, like the record to reflect that Councilman Miller is in attendance. Mr. Miller, welcome. Is there a public comment? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, no one is signed in. In your packet, there's the minutes of the November 8th meeting. If they're in order, I'll accept the motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Against? We'll stand as is, thank you. 2014-0247, please. Resolution number 2014-0247, a resolution making an award on requisition number 30402 to Oriana House in the amount not to exceed $744,000 for the Cognitive Skills <coughs> Development Program for the period 7-1-2014 through 6-30-2017, authorizing the county executive to execute the contract and all other documents consistent with said award in this resolution and declaring the necessity that this resolution become immediately effective. Mr. Murphy. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Council. Uh, the uh, Board of, of uh, the Corrections Planning Board is recommending this award in the amount of $744,000 over a three year period. Uh, this was RFP'd over the summer, and uh, Oriana House was the winning bid. Uh, we held this uh, specifically because we, we got a report from uh, Judge Russo. Uh, Judge? There was a concern Good that afternoon. you had. There was a concern that you had regarding Oriana House. There is, uh, but I want to preface this by saying that I use Oriana House exclu almost exclusively for the reentry court program, and I use them because they're our only lockdown facility. They do many, many things right. So I, I do want to put that in context. Many, many things they do right, and that's why I continually use them for the reentry court population, which is a very high-risk population. They've had very good success with it. I will say also Danielle Alexander there is a phenomenal worker who coordinates well with reentry court. I have two issues. One is a recent issue that I understand has been remedied, but nonetheless, I think merits some discussion. And the other issue uh, is one that has been ongoing and I'm hoping will be remedied. The first issue is that I recently learned from a client in reentry court that they were not receiving treatment because of a retirement. And I was surprised to hear it, did not take it at face value, and actually made some inquiries because I found it difficult to believe that a place that was giving services would not make arrangements for retirement in order to keep treatment continuous. I did find out, in fact, it was true that uh, what the client had called to tell me, the reentry court client had called to tell me that they were not expected to get treatment for three weeks due to retirement was true. Oriana did have some people call me and tell me they were going to remedy it. I did talk to Luis Vasquez, who also addressed the problem, and I understand that they took care of it. Uh, my concern about that is uh, I don't think it's appropriate for me to learn that from a client in reentry court. And I think that when they have staffing problems like that, that they should be more transparent with us as users of it. Because as I said, treatment needs to be continuous to be effective. And gaps in treatment and housing people somewhere for three weeks without any services does, is not conducive to anybody. It's not conducive to the people, and it's not conducive to the people paying the bill. I do hope it's been remedied. I can certainly trust that council can put in the appropriate controls that if those things happen again, that council would be notified or the court or whoever you believe is appropriate. The only other issue I've had, I've seen with Oriana, this has been an ongoing issue, I do know they're trying to address it, is that there is, uh, there are drugs in the facility. And, and that is problematic, obviously, because we're sending people there to be cured of drug addictions, and they are able to get drugs in the facility. I do see progress. I have seen progress over the last eight years in Rancher Court where they're getting uh, tighter on the controls. Uh, again, I tell you I use this facility because it's a lockdown. So although there are drugs at Oriana House, I will tell you that they're not the only facility that has drugs in them, and they have the least amount of drugs, in my experience. Some of the other people we contract with have much more ease of access because of the way people going in and out of facilities. Oriana is much more controlled. But I do think we could do better. And as the core, I will speak for myself for Rancher Court, I'm happy to do anything I can to help them do that. 
Um, I am ha happy to give them specific ex instances if they need it, assistance if they need it, but I would like to see a real crackdown there about drugs in the facility so that we can help encourage these people to not use while they're getting the treatment. Judge, how many uh, judges are there that handle the reentry court? Just me. Just you. So you would be the go-to person as far as any concerns Just for reentry court, right. Okay. Right. Now, I do. Now other judges use Oriana House. In mm -hmm. general probation, we use it. Drug court may use it. So all of us have access to it, and all of us have the ability to use it. I specifically use it for this population because, as I said, it is a high-risk population. These people are released from prison in the middle of their terms, put on an intensive form of supervision, and then do this reentry program that our county developed eight, nine years ago, which has done very well. We have an 85% success rate, meaning we only have a 15% recidivism rate over watching them for three years. It's the most successful program in the state of Ohio, and one of the most successful we can find. So Orient has been an integral partner for me in doing that, in achieving those statistics, but I would like to see us do better. Okay. Any questions for the judge? None, none for the judge. Okay. Is there a representative Oriana House player here, please? Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Chairman, members of council, Jim Lawrence from Oriana House. Mr. Lawrence? Yep. Thank you. Mr. Lawrence, uh, you heard the concern of uh, the judge, and I talked to Judge Russo also over at the administrative judge, and he assured me that that you've been made aware of this and that there's been some smoothing over of what had happened? Yeah, I think that there's probably some miscommunication. The original person was supposed to, in question with the judge, was supposed to go to treatment, didn't, so we had a miscommunication between our caseworker and our counselor when he didn't show our caseworker should have told him that, so we ended up placing him two weeks later. Uh, the other one on the retirement, the person who replaced that person was hired, so that's not uh, completely accurate, but we, we would normally if something like that happened, we would just bring someone up to do that, whether we pay them overtime or bring them in to do it. It may be a one-day thing. For example, say group start on Monday, we end up on Tuesday. So we've resolved that problem. So hopefully that would not happen again about that issue specific to that. What can, I mean, what do we have to tell us that that's not going to happen again? What have you, what We've have been running you, groups for a very long time, so that's the first time we ever had that issue. Why don't we do this... Uh, if, if we do have concerns about that, we don't have to be notified, but certainly the court has to the be notified. The court should have been notified. That's what I said. It was a miscommunication originally because the person, and we're not sure he was told to go to group, the person in question, the client, didn't go to start treatment, and the treatment counselor did not inform the caseworker because he should have started the next day. So instead, they started on the 17th, which judge, is about a few days after the judge contacted us. Judge, is there anything that you would suggest to make this a little bit easier for you as far as contact? From Oriana House? Uh, I have to say that other than this issue, Oriana has been. Excuse me, Judge, can you come up to the mic? Uh, other than this issue, uh, Oriana House has been phenomenally communicative with me mm -hmm. in the sense that we're getting emails every day. We're, we are very good at communicating back and forth. Uh, this is an aberration. Okay. It's an aberration that concerns me because you can always have retirements, interruptions of service. And what concerned me the most was that I didn't hear about it. From Oriana. And Oriana did have an executive call me and say, yes, we made this mistake. We may, you know, we'll correct it. But I am a little concerned that had I not been told what would have happened. Mm -hmm. That's what concerns me. So if they can assure me that there are things in place, I'm happy to take them at their word. I've been very happy with their work, as I've said before, other than these two issues. And and I don't I don't think anybody has any concern about the quality of care and the services provided. It's just that this did jump, jump out, and I didn't want it to happen again. So if we can, as the judge says, take you at your word that uh, this won't happen in the future, we can move forward. Unless anyone has any other questions? Mr. Greenspan? Thank you. Not, not on the staffing issue, but on, on the drug issue. Sure, I can and obviously, uh, understanding that it's, it's not specifically related to your organization, but that there is an issue. Are there, are there any opportunities for, or let me ask you this, what, what do you do as far as drug prevention in your facility? We do a lot, okay. and I think we'll continue to do a lot, and I think the judge is correct. We can always improve. We do things. Um, we do uh, lots and lots of drug testing on a regular basis, random basis with drug screens. Uh, we do what we call um, police kind of pat down the street search. Our biggest problem isn't 
um, opiates, or those things, that's our biggest problem of use, but you can detect that by drug screens. Our biggest problem is K2, which you really can't drug test for. You can, but every time they keep changing the formulas, it makes it more difficult. So those are what we find people using, and we try to stop that coming in the door by doing lots of pat-downs. Um, we do use drug dogs. We do searches. We have a search team that we just put together in the last year that does nothing but searches facilities for us in different areas, including Summit County and Cuyahoga County. But I will reiterate, it's still, these people still have access to the community at some point in the program, and any time you do that, you're always going to have people trying to bring drugs back in the program. And they can't keep drugs out of maximum security facilities. We won't be able to be 100% successful. I think we do a very good job. I think the judge even stated we do have less drugs than other facilities in the area, but we have it as a focus on our facility, all of our facilities to keep the drugs out so people can do that. But you're always going to have a small portion of clients who are going to try to bring drugs in or use drugs on the outside. And that's what, what we do many, many things on that, but all the searches, all the pathons, drug screens. We do ALCO screens, and anyone who leaves the facility comes back, it's screened for using alcohol, but we do extensive drug testing. The biggest problem is K2, it's more bulk, so we can find that easier on a search of their body, but we can't really always test for that. We keep working with the coroner to get, we keep up with it, but it keeps changing. And we do as much as we can on that. And if, okay. if and just so I use the correct terminology, folks that you treat, what do you refer to them as? Consumers, clients, clients, residents, consumers. offenders. Okay. If, things. if they're found to be in possession, what what do you what do you if, do with if that? They, okay, if they're found to be in possession, then we've been working with the uh, sheriff's office to see if sometimes we can bring charges, which doesn't always happen. We're trying to get that kind of thing. If we find them with bringing drugs in the facility, that would be a, re a reason to get terminated. If someone uses drugs on a drug screen, that could be a sign of a relapse. We may continue them in treatment. We contact the court uh, if it's been more than one time. You kind of still have to contact the court, and if it's on probation, probation officer, make sure they're okay with it. We tend to want to keep people in treatment who are relapsing and have used drugs on outside the facility. But if you're caught if bringing drugs in the facility or you have drugs in the facility and we find them, then that would be a reason to terminate you. But, but if you terminate, do you, what does termination mean? Do they, if they're on probation? They go back, do, they would go to county jail and then they, they go, go back, back to They go back to the judge for a probation violation to see if they needed another program in the community or the judge at their option send them to prison or it's really the judge's call at that point. And how frequently upon a determination that someone either is using or carrying or in possession, do you refer them back to the court for um, possible parole vi or violation? Or you talking about overall statistics? Yeah, I mean, is it? I, I understand the objective is is to keep folks who are, need treatment in treatment. But if you're finding someone is habitually violating the, your policies or the court's order, do you send them back? Sure. To, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And how frequently do. do you do that? I don't have it off the top of my head. We have lots of, we have negative, we don't have a lot of positive drug screens in a year's time when we do that. We literally do tens of thousands, so we do not. But mm -hmm. I would say that's one of the biggest reasons that we end up terminating people is using drugs on the outside and getting, you know, continuing to use it, which we get back to court if we find them with drugs. So the we, other reason we have people who don't return to the facility sometimes, and that would be because they've used drugs and they know we'll find out when we do a drug screen so they don't return. So that would actually be, a walls, but they end up then getting arrested and going back in front of the court for probation violation. So when you say last question, so when you say terminate, you don't mean terminate as if saying you're no longer in the program and you know here's the front door. Termination means back to back to jail. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, through the chair, um, are there anything? Any body cavity searches or anything like that? No, there are not. We do what would be called. Um, like police pat-downs on the street. With K2, I mean, they, all, they hide in their groin. We know where it's at. I mean, that's what they had, groin in their shoes because it has some bulk. Think of ounces of marijuana. It comes in some bulk, so it's difficult to hide and if you're being searched that way. Yeah, we don't do cavity searches. No, that, we can't do that. I mean, we don't want to do that. And I'm wondering, I, I used to work at Oriana at one time, so I'm just wondering, like Grafton, even the employees had to go through a pat-down or... No, a search don't. type thing. Do we have that here at Oregon? No, we've never had that problem. If we had that problem, we would look into it, but we've never had any issue with that so far. That's typically what happens in maximum security, I would agree, is staff brings the drugs in because they can't get in any other way, either visitors or staff. But we haven't had that problem, to my knowledge. Okay, so how do we... 
Well, if the, believe me, if, the, if we caught someone with it and the staff gave it to them, they, they would be the first to tell us. <laughs> okay. That all? All set? Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Murphy, uh, I see time-wise this is another one of those contracts that started uh, last July. So is there a need to move this forward without the three readings, I would imagine? Yes, sir. Okay. Anything else for Mr. Murphy? Hearing none, um, I'll accept a motion for resolution 2014-0247 to the full council on under suspension of the rules. Second. All in favor? Aye. Against? Thank you, sir. Thank you. <coughs> 0287. Resolution number 2014-0287, a resolution authorizing a contract with 3M Cogent in the amount not to exceed $1,578,156.22 for hardware and software maintenance and support services for the automated fingerprint identification system for the period 7-1-2014 through 6-30-2019, authorizing the county executive to execute the contract and all other documents consistent with this resolution and declaring the necessity that this resolution become immediately effective. Good afternoon, Alberta Cologne, Deputy Chief of Staff. Uh, I'm here on behalf of actually Ken Mills, Director of Public Safety and Justice Services, who's currently out of town and had asked uh, if I'd do this uh, legislative piece for him. Um, and so I have a couple of notes that he relayed and would like me to share. Uh, the APHIS system is uh, the automated fingerprint identification system. It really consists of about uh, four components. The first component, and the most expensive, is the actual servers that run the APHIS system. Uh, the second component are the live scans. Those are the fingerprint uh, uh, systems that are used in the jails when you book someone in. Uh, the third component is a latent workstation. That's used usually by examiners. There's some out in the police departments, the medical examiner and Cleveland police. Those are the scanners, the, the photographs, when they go and actually lift a print from a crime scene. That's uh, the latent workstations are the workstations that actually do uh, the forensic work on those, uh, those lifted prints. And the last piece is the rapid ID or mobile devices. Those are small little devices that actually typically just check one finger. Just uh, in those cases, we kind of think we know who you are. Uh, and in that case, we just want to double check uh, who you are before we release you. Uh, and so that's what an APHIS is. The APHIS uh, is obviously just a repository for fingerprints uh, to be able to store and retrieve that information accordingly. As a little bit of a background on the, the current APHIS and the maintenance agreement that we have in front of you, uh, the county and the city of Cleveland worked together uh, to purchase the APHIS uh, back in October of 2009. There was a shared RFP that went out, and through that RFP competitive process, it was awarded to, uh, at that time, Cogent Systems. Uh, they have subsequently renamed, and that they're known now. They're bought out by 3M, and they're now known as 3M Cogent. Uh, through that process, uh, uh, there was a memorialized MOU between the city and the county, and so there's, sh there's shared ownership between the APHIS. So the APHIS is a, a fingerprinting server and system, 50% owned by the city of Cleveland, 50% owned uh, by Cuyahoga County. That initial investment was approximately $3 million, and the implementation, because it's complex, was took you know a few years uh, in order to implement, and they went live. Uh, towards the end of 11 and really started going, uh, using it full-time use January 1st of 2012. So that brings us to today. The first two years were included, uh, uh, two and a half, two years were actually included in the maintenance. Uh, as part of the RFP, they added another six months uh, into it as well. So two and a half years were included as part of the original uh, contract. Uh, right now we're sitting here to really begin the implementation of the five-year maintenance agreement for that system. Uh, the, it's hardware and software maintenance. They maintain, the AFIS is its, it's, is its own network. Uh, and so it, uh, they're gonna they maintain all the servers and all the software. The Department of IT provides support through Director Maori for the outside internet to get in. Um, but uh, most of the work on the servers and hardware are done by the vendor themselves. It's a not to exceed 1.5 uh, seven, eight million dollars, uh, and uh, that's over a five-year period. It's a fixed cost, and so in year one, it's about 244,000, year two, 298,000, year three, 334,000, uh, year four, 344,000, and year five, 
55,000. And so it's about a 3% escalator in 16, 17, and 18 for this maintenance agreement. Um, the agreement uh, is funded by the Department of Public Safety through the REDS budget. So it's in the REDS budget, but we, we charge back to applicable agencies. So those agencies, so this contract is with the Department of Public Safety, they'll pay cogent, and then through reimbursements, uh, through the Sheriff's Department is a user of it, so they pay uh, through, a voc through a journal entry back uh, to the public safety, the medical examiner is a user. Cleveland Police is a user. They pay, they provide through an agreement a charge back uh, for their services, and then various other municipalities, based on what you have, you pay a user fee. And so those those municipalities that actually use the system and will pay for the maintenance is, uh, are Brooklyn Heights, Brook Park, Cleveland Heights, Euclid, Garfield, Maple, Mayfield, North Royalton, Parma, Solon. Lorraine County is also a user. We expect that list to constantly expand over the next, uh, uh, you know, five years or so. What's happening is some of the older police, some of the police departments have that have jails have older live scans, and so as they upgrade those live scans for their jails, what they'll end up doing is they'll just they'll tie them into our system. So the list is going to keep keep growing uh, over time on that. Um, the, uh, I have a note here from Ken, the vendor is registered, was approved by the TAC board in August, and the RFP exemption process uh, was approved uh, through the CPB September of 15. Uh, he is asking that we move forward uh, without three readings, Mr. Chairman, and the reason for it being late was it, it took a significant amount of time for uh, the contract uh, to be uh, approved uh, and then the back and forth to happen with 3M Cogent. Questions for Mr. Colon, Mr. Greenspan. Thank you. The um, this one point six million dollar contract you said it's. I was a little confused. Is it split fifty fifty with the city of Cleveland and the county? Uh, so it, it, it's uh, there's fixed costs on the device that you have. So the core, the servers themselves, the core APHIS, which is a significant amount uh, of the of the annual maintenance. Uh, in 2014, for example, about 100,000 of it is the core server. The core server is split 50-50, straight down the middle. So that bill, when we invoice, when the department invoices the sheriff's office, it's going to be 50% so of that. And when they invoice the city of Cleveland, it's 50%. And then also, depending on the, the devices you have, you get charged for that as well. So it's not, a, it's not a, a, a contractual split between us and Cleveland to the extent where they're the only two provider, only two users who are paying for this. It's based on all users. You mentioned Parma and, and other cities. All of those cities share in that in that hardware, the core component. You said they share in that those costs. Uh, no, they share in the devices that they're using. The core itself, okay. the servers themselves, are only paid for by the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County by the sheriff and Cleveland Police. Is is this one point six million? 50% of the cost or 100% of the cost? Uh, it's 100% of the cost of all of the maintenance for APHIS. Okay, and then and then we send effectively invoices out to Cleveland to that get is, reimbursed. That is correct. So um, Cleveland, in Cleveland's example, they're going to have two line, they're going to have actually a few line items, but one line item is going to be 50% of the servers, the core, and then for every device they have, they pay maintenance for that. So they have a couple live scans, et cetera. And what type of, of agreements do we have, talking signed documents, with the various, with Cleveland specifically as it relates sure. to the core hardware infrastructure, and then on an ongoing basis with the varying communities as they come on board or are already existing users? Sure, the agreements already exist. They've existed for a very long time. Those are the REDS agreements. So uh, currently we charge through the REDS program, we charge municipalities, the department does, for if they're a MyChris user for the red system, a license plate reader user, there's different technologies that we charge back currently. This is just another line item. So if you're an APHIS user, you have that added to your monthly invoice from the department. Okay. The the, the contract with 3M Cogent, is it a, obviously we talk, we're talking about expanding the licensees. Is this an unlimited licensee arrangement or do we have to pay when a new license, a fee to include a new license? Yes. Yeah, so there's no, so two part, there is no, um, this maintenance is based on the current devices uh, that exist today, uh, and there's no escalation as we add prices. But as you add a device, so if you add a live scan, the maintenance is built into that agreement. 
uh, initially. So, you, so someone buy a new life scan today, that'll take them to 2018, and then at that point, we'll add them to this system. So it, it's just a requirement that uh, you got to have maintenance on the system if you want to tie it to our, our server. And um, last question, the, the upgrades, uh, we're talking about hardware and software maintenance and support. What about upgraded software? Yes, that's, uh, that's all included within this maintenance. Also, uh, all the software included at this time. Uh, what's also included is uh, uh, they actually have an on-site technical resource uh, that spends, uh, my understanding, is about 75% of their time here only on this project. So it includes that uh, as well. To note, I, I would expect in the next four years or so, you'll see some expansion to the APHIS. Uh, you'll see expansion on the core side of it. I think you're going to see... Um, this is probably, if not the fastest, one of the fastest APHISs in the, in, uh, the state. Uh, it, it's probably likely the fastest, but we're going to run into storage issues. So I think you'll see some enhancements in the storage area in the future. In that example, we'll add maintenance to get us through 18 when we procure that. Okay, thank you. Can answer your question? Ms. Cano. Uh, through the chair to uh, Mr. Colon. You stated that the devices are split amongst the various cities. Sure. Is um, that where the REDS user fees, the moving violation fees, and the general fund subsidy plays a role? No, the, the subsidy pr predominantly, it's approximately about a million dollars a year. That predominantly, but the REDS budget to operate is, is a little less than $3 million. Um, uh, the revenue that they receive from these municipalities uh, is forecasted somewhere around 600000 That's uh, these chargebacks here. So the million dollars predominantly goes to staffing. Uh, most of the staff uh, currently works in the IT department to support the server, the current servers that run my Chris. That That's million, the main application. That million is from the general fund? Uh, that million dollars is from the revenue, the million dollars in revenue that we receive from the $5 okay. uh, from the moving violations. So predominantly that's staffing. And the 600000 comes from the user the, fees? The user fees from the various municipalities. And, and what does the general fund subsidy do? Uh, I'd have to refer that to the director. Uh, um, I'd have to ask him. I, I don't recall off the top of my head what his subsidy is. Is it several hundred thousand dollars, though? Uh, so I would somewhere a little less than half a million dollars, I would suspect. Um, next question. Have the costs for the hardware and software maintenance and support services increased since last year, last contract? At the cost. Are they the same? I know it was, we're, we're projecting on a five year versus a two. And sure, so the, these costs are fixed over the, over the five year period. This is for maintenance, services and maintenance only. Uh, the cost for the hardware itself, if we were to procure any of the new hardware, good, like a, a live scan, Mm -hmm. um, I do believe that that cost is different uh, than it was when we uh, implemented the system in 2009. So, so hardware is different. This is just fixed. This is just fixed, fixed maintenance, maintenance costs that are based on the devices themselves that exist today. Mm, I can pass for now. Mr. Miller's cost based on. Mr. Chairman, Chief, is the cost of this contract provided for in our, in our current budget, or does it require new money? Mr. Chairman, the councilman, I believe in two th this year, I can answer that this year we're, we're, it's in included. Uh, I'd have to refer to the director whether it's in 15. Mr. Chairman, I'd also have to see if there was a budget amendment done or not. I'm, I'm not sure. Could you find out and I get can. back to me? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Just one final question. On, on the $5 fee, I know that there's, there been, there's been discussion over the last few years that some communities were not remitting that $5 fee. Has that issue been rectified? Uh, Mr. Chairman, to, my, to, to the councilman, to my knowledge, I don't believe, uh, I, I do know that there's been an, in, an increase uh, in the last few years because of the, the effort that we made. I'd have to get you an update on where we're at with that. Uh, I'd have to have the director figure out if we're getting 100% participation. I don't believe we're getting. I still think there's two or three outliers out there still. Could, could you, before vote on Tuesday, uh, assuming this 
comes out of committee today with the Tuesday suspension. Can you please provide that information? And I believe there were some other, my, Ms. Conwell, I believe had a couple, had a question or two that may needed to be, that needed to be followed up on if they could all be presented at the same time. Sure, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I, I know that I can provide some of the Conwell's, Councilwoman Conwell's question quickly because the fiscal officer is for, for Director Mills is here. Uh, I will reach out to Director Mills, who's currently out of town. He would have the information on the $5 fee, but I'll see if he can give it to me before. I believe he returns on Monday. I think it's the general fund subsidy. General fund subsidy. I can get That's very easy to get. Who are the outliers? Excuse me? Uh, I believe Lakewood and the city of Cleveland, I believe. I know those are two that came to mind initially. It's probably been a year is since this, I personally have been involved this, in it at the, the time. Same, is, is this the same argument that went back to uh, we, we got a ruling that stated they owed it from, a, from I believe, Supreme Court? Right. And city of Cleveland's law department somehow decided they were going to trump the opinion of the Supreme Court. Yeah, if why, I recall correctly. Why am I going to move this thing yeah. forward if they're going to be playing games with $5 fees? Sure, Mr. Chairman. I think the first part is I think it is the same discussion that you're just mentioning right now. Uh, secondly, this is unrelated to uh, <laughs> the moving violation that funds the Reds budget. This is, we, this is a maintenance agreement that we currently have. If you have the heart, which is systems that's currently in use today, and that's a vital system being used by public safety partners today. It is being paid for today by the users. Uh, so it is kind of unrelated. But it's kind of it like the ankle bones connected to the knee bone. I mean, this was over a year ago, year and a half ago, I heard this, I heard this debate. That's accurate, Mr. Chairman, because I don't do recall most of it either, so it's been a while. Doing? What are we doing about it? Who do I contact to find out what we're doing about that? I've never heard of a law department in any city in any state trump a decision or an opinion by a Supreme Court of that state. Right. Sure, Mr. Chairman. I can get back and find out where we left off, but I do where, need to speak to the I director mean, about what, it. What hammer are we hitting them with? I think we have a pretty pretty big hammer with it. With we do. Hammer. I think again, Mr. Chairman, I got to I got to go back and see where we left off. I know that our law department was involved in those discussions. I know we sent uh, some pretty harsh letters to the to the individual municipalities. I know we definitely saw an increase, uh, but I don't know. Uh, I can go back and look and see what I relate to what I you know transferred over to the director. I can I can well, find that out for you. We'll catch up on that at a, at another time. I I find it interesting that that. Uh, Cleveland is still resting on an opinion of their own law department. Mr. Chair. It might if, be historical in the United States, Mr. Green. Yeah, if, if I may, I mean, we, we obviously um, have the authority here. We could, if we chose to, um, provide a provision that we will only provide services to municipalities that are current to us in their, in their, in their, uh, payment for services. So if, if, a, if a municipality owes us money, hasn't paid this $5 fee, um, we can withhold, I believe we can withhold service from them. We might need to act legislatively to do that, but um, it's our contract. I, I, you know, I, I would argue that those participants who are doing what they're supposed to do, living up to their agreement, should not be penalized as a result of a two, or, two or three outliers. But those outliers, clearly, we, we should be able to maybe look to Mr. Boatwright, we should be able to withhold services to some, just like any business would. If you don't pay your electric bill, you turn your electric off. So if somebody owes us pursuant to a contract, they don't pay us. We don't provide them services. Mr. Boatwright. And I, I've got to sort of look back. I know some people in the law department have dealt with this issue. It wasn't me personally, so I've, I, I got to go back and do a little research, and then we can get back to you on that, the status of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mr. Chairman, this doesn't necessarily have to be specific to this contract. It could be an overall position that the county will provide services to those cities who pay for the services. And if you don't pay for it, then you're not eligible to receive the services that are being provided. Now, I would caveat that if you have a city like East Cleveland that's in financial distress, it's a little different scenario. But if you've got cities that are, are well within their means to provide to pay for the services we're providing, they should pay for it. If they don't, they don't get the service. They do is craft legislation to the, to that effect, as opposed to 
holding this contract up because, as Mr. Greenspan says, this this would probably be a lot broader than we than we know right now. I only know about the five dollar situation because I was at the Reds meeting. Uh, I, I thought it was taken care of. I can't Mr. why it hasn't been. I, I just a yes, few comments. I agree with uh, Councilman Greenspan that I think overall across the board that something that we legislative we should do. And that was that was our next question uh, that we continue this uh, this legislation here, but look for, look for this to be a solution across the board that we legislative act and, and those who do not uh, make good on their uh, their bills that they don't be able to, to receive the service. Right. So why don't if if the committee, Mr. Gr Mr. Germana. Yeah, I'm just kind of shocked by all this, and uh, you know, if Mr. Boatwright, when you when you look into this, if you could bring us up to date, what what Cleveland's argument is, and and uh, because I'm finding this unbelievable, uh, I'm just amazed. Well, what is owed? If I'm and I may be mistaken, but what was owed a year and a half ago was substantial. This this was something that had been going on for a number of years. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, a, couple, a couple comments on that. I, I don't re recall it being that significant. Also, where there was a lot of debate on what is actually old. Um, I know that the discussion that we had at the time was none of it was in the rears. It was all moving forward. Uh, I do know besides the Cleveland Law Department, it was the Cleveland Court too. Uh, so it was uh, the judge, uh, Judge Adrian, and also the judge, the presiding judge over in the city of Lakewood as well. Uh, we're challenging this. So I do believe that this particular topic is one uh, that's that's ultimately going to go, that's going to take a while to resolve. As you move forward with this discussion, that I think will take a while, uh, I just I would just say be mindful of un, uh, some unintentional acts that happen if you do proceed with something like this. For example, uh, if a city like Lakewood or a city like the city of Cleveland, we, we refuse to provide them services because of an administration because they're not paying accurately. Uh, that means that they're, we're shutting off services to the cops using and running license plates in the streets every single day. So well, that seems, we just got to be mindful be a, of that. That seems to be a risk being taken by the legislators of that community, if not the, the, the course of that community. If I remember correctly, I think the community court was cutting, doing anything they could to avoid the fee to the point of writing decisions, exempting the perpetrators or those found guilty uh, of paying the fee. I may I might be wrong, but bottom line, it's not this it's not this panel that's that's putting anyone in jeopardy, let alone the police officers. It's a, it's the administrative or the legislative or, or the legislative or the judicial branch of the municipalities in question. So I, I don't see a downside in us withholding anything from anybody for being in arrears, unless it were for a life, life and death situation that, were out of, that was out of the controls of those legislative, judicial, or executive branch individuals. So I don't, I don't see a problem with that whatsoever, and I think we should move forward. Mr. Greenspan, Mr. Harrison, if you would uh, take charge of that, I would greatly appreciate it. It could come from this committee, but move it on to the, uh, to the full council. I would suggest the poll council would be interested in doing that, but no more questions. I, if there are no more questions, uh, I would. Mr. Chairman, I would just, move the, just go to, ahead now. Yeah, just to comment on on the legislation, the possible legislation moving forward. Um, although I agree that we should have some sort of user fees or be able to collect our fees in the agreements that we have, we also have to look at that we are. Regional, trying to bring everybody in, be collaborative, and things of that nature. So maybe before some legislation is pushed forward, we bring in the regional director, maybe some of these municipalities that we're having uh, yeah, actually, issues with, and have before we just push it into like, if you don't, we're going to take this. Well, type it's, of thing. it's gone well beyond that. This this is an. Uh, this is an opinion, I believe it was an opinion of the Supreme Court, if I'm not mistaken. But it was, it was, it was. I think it was the Attorney General's office. Was it the Attorney General? I believe it was the Attorney General. And, and the, our law department and, did a separate, a separate one as well. I think our right. prosecutor, I'm sorry. So I think we have two of them. Yeah. Um, 
I don't think we should be held hostage by uh, uh, judi judicial uh, fencing or, let, or, or attorneys fencing over $5 fees. There's bigger things to fight about. But I thought this was taken care of. I can't believe it's still going on. But we'll look at it. We'll, we'll craft it in a, in a manner that is not to affect anyone of life and limb. But, you know, this isn't the old days when we would just hand over money and walk away. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Miller? Uh, I totally share your concern that this needs to be resolved. But... Uh, I do think that Ms. Conwell's suggestion has merit, that, it, that if we can, uh, can use our Department of Collaboration, that's, that's what it's there for, and, and, and we should bring in the appropriate parties and, 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 and say, uh, this is something that we need to resolve, and in the spirit of collaboration, we should try to resolve it by discussion and not have to have, uh, have punitive legislation or further court battles. If, if we can, we should give it a shot. Thank you. Mr. Mano. <clears throat> uh, again, this is, this is the first time I've heard this, but in all due respect, our side might not be right. I mean, there is this possibility that there, and, and I have no idea what the argument is, but it's possible that they're right and we're wrong and they're entitled not to. So before we start really laying down the hammer, I think we really need to find out if they are definitely wrong. I'm 100% behind doing whatever we have to do if, if they're wrong. But there is a possibility that their reason is defensible. And, and then what we've got to do is, if it's defensible for them, it's going to be defensible for these other cities. We've, we've got to get over this hurdle one way or another. And... Ultimately, it's a court of law, and maybe this needs to go all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, but in defense of them, if they have a legitimate, reasonable argument, uh, maybe we should look at that and, and uh, solve this dilemma. Mr. Boatwright, while I, I understand my colleague's passion to uh, do what's right, uh, this has gone. This has been a battle between law departments, the attorney general. Now, evidently, what's our next step, and why hasn't that step been made by the county in the past year and a half? Do you are you aware of this? I I, I know tangentially about the issue, and I know the law department has looked into it on some level, but um, I don't personally know all of the. Okay. I'm not the one. I will go back and research it okay. uh, and and talk to our folks. I believe their answers to all these questions. I, I just don't personally have them, unfortunately. Uh, and I didn't know this was going to come up in this meeting. But I will find the answers, and then you know either I or somebody else from the law department will get back to you a, as soon yeah. as possible. Sure. To Mr. Boatwright, this could have even been solved, correctly? It's possible that it's solved. So I, yeah, I, I just don't personally know, and so we'll, we'll is, find it's, out. It's, it's, Hasn't been solved. I, I don't. I mean, I can't say with certainty. Again, I've been removed from it from about a year, but I, I can tell you, I, I would remember if it's been entirely resolved. Uh, I do know that of the list of those that weren't significant amount of them have Parma's a good example. They weren't doing it the way that we believe they should be doing it. About a year and a half ago, they they're doing it current the, the what we believe is the right way today. But I would know if I would have remembered if it was resolved. I think there's still a handful of cities out there that, that have not been resolved. So and we, we I were, can say with certainty, I don't believe it is resolved. The year and a half ago that I remember this coming up, the next step was going to court. Yeah. I don't know why we have it. I think so. And, and, the, and the reason being is the police chief of Cleveland at that time was in the meeting, and his, his statement, I believe, was our law department tells us we don't have to. Well then we should have been in court a year and a half ago. Seems like everybody kind of dug themselves in, and what happens? It should have been the law department, and they should have pursued it. So if you could check into that, Mr. Boatwright, I would still suggest we, we look forward to uh, 
some legislation that protects us in the future so we can avoid situations like this because if folks know that out there is legislation that they're gonna have to pay us, they can't go to their law department and say no. We don't have to do that. Sure. Just to, to the assurances of, and I shouldn't have to say this, but this body has never acted emotionally on any issue. And so we will deliberately go through the process of bringing forward legislation, having committee hearings to the councilwoman's concerns if necessary clearly we'll bring in those to provide testimony or provide if we want to get my, my concept I can't speak for mr. Harrison but my concept of this legislation is generic to county services overall not yeah, specifically to, to the, this yeah. specific piece of legislation that we're discussing on the agenda today but if we wish to get more specific on this then by all means we've never shut anybody out our meetings are public we've always had open and candid discussions regarding legislation and that's how I would envision this piece of legislation we're talking about be conducted and so uh, there'll be fair and open process obviously it won't be it won't be this year but um, but we will clearly um, um, move forward with this in an open transparent fashion mr. chair we'll have we'll have a report from the law department as to exactly where this is at so we can at least decide how to go forward mr. Greenspan Mr. Or, or mr. Mano, or mr. Harrison uh, I apologize. No, no, that's okay uh, I wholeheartedly agree, and, and I'd like to be a co-sponsor of that legislation where, you know, what's good for the goose, good for the gander, and we want to be fair, and cities got to be fair to us, and we're going to be fair to the city. So uh, I think having legislation come out, uh, delineating what the responsibilities, and if you're going to have programs with the, the Cuyahoga County, you're going to uh, play ball. <laughs> According to the rules and I and I think that legislation would assure that passion is taken out of this exactly. that up front mr. Harrison mr. Chair, I just want to say that I agree I my, my feelings are the same as mr. Greenspan's in terms of how this legislation will look it's really about the big picture not really so much about this here this legislation but overall and going forward you know just going back to uh, we had some a rocket start with our Euclid project we got that role and just you know really just kind of covering ourselves as we move along in this piece and and that is my reason for supporting and, and it also allows us as mr. Greenspan says to put in there those that can not afford it certainly we if we can we will pick it up so places uh, like East Cleveland and whatnot we're here to we're certainly here to help okay um, anything further Okay, I'll accept a motion for resolution 2014-0287 to the full council for second reading under suspension. Second. All in favor? Aye. Against? Thank you, Mr. Clum. Thank you. And now, one of my, I think our, our favorite subjects uh, would be 0288, Janine. Resolution number 2014-0288, a resolution authorizing an agreement with the Metro Health System in the amount not to exceed $18,845,022.45 for management, health care, and related services at the Cuyahoga County Correction Center for the period 1-1-2015 through 12-31-2019. Authorizing the county executive to execute the agreement and all other documents consistent with this resolution and declaring the necessity that this resolution become immediately effective. Mr. Sheriff, before you start, and, it's, uh, and specifically to this committee and, and actually all the members of the council, but to your, to your folks over in the Sheriff's Department, our friends at Metro, this has been probably one, other than the, other than the kitchen jail, the jail kitchen, uh, this has been probably our, our most um, important piece of legislation coming through this committee. And uh, I think with the cooperation of everybody involved, we've, we've, I've never been happy to give away almost $19 million, but this is, this is something that we worked hard for and we've been doing this for over two, two and a half years just to get to this point in time. And, uh, and Sheriff, uh, certainly uh, you're owed a, a, a pat on the back for that with your folks, folks at Metro and certainly this committee. I really appreciate all the hard work everyone's done. Has not been an easy road, has not been the easiest of times to get here, but uh, we're here. So Sheriff, take it away. Uh, Chairman and Council, uh, first of all, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Council's assistance in this, in this whole venture. Uh, Dr. Boutros from Metro, our County Executive, 
uh, Mary Weir Boylan, uh, Dr. Tallman, our, our medical director, Vespina, and their staffs, our fiscal department led by Donna Cleo, law department Joe Boatwright helped uh, uh, write this uh, contract that we're proposing today, and Public Works for, for stepping up to the plate and, and, and uh, uh, realizing some of our goals with us. Some of the goals that have been achieved already before I go into the contract, uh, the assessments as the inmates come into the facility uh, are clearly quicker, faster, uh, almost on spot within 24 hours, uh, better quality of care, electronic medical records are now a reality, x-ray machines, uh, ultrasound, we no longer have to take prisoners out to uh, Metro. And, and, and that alone, uh, we, we realize uh, substantial savings in, in transport, uh, is which uh, about a year and a half ago is when I first approached council, and that was a big concern of mine uh, as we were doing the budget process. Uh, presently, uh, outside medical contracts, uh, if this uh, contract is approved, uh, will all go away uh, in 2015. So that, that's another uh, uh, great story. Um, our uh, capital project, I'd like to start with that. Uh, we have uh, $1.1 million that we're going to be carrying over that we have not used this year. Uh, we projected uh, uh, with Dr. Tallman's assistance and, and Metro uh, to bring workstations in uh, as we deliver uh, pharmaceuticals to the inmates in their pods. Uh, it'll be all electronic. Everything else in there is electronic as we speak, but when we go there, we're still doing paper at the pods themselves. Um, we want to uh, bring in dentistry. Right now, we still uh, send out dentists. We have a dentist come in a couple days a week, but for emergencies, we'd like to set up a station within the facility. Uh, we've already earmarked a spot, uh, and that will we'll do all dental uh, x-rays and, and uh, extractions within the facility, which is unheard of. Um, Pathology, ISTAT I testing, uh, and then, uh, like I said, the works stations will have to have servers. That's what we've earmarked some of the capital for as we go forward. Uh, the budget uh, for 2015, I, I think I put a, a copy in front of uh, uh, all council. Uh, we're projecting 3.3 million for the Metro contract. Uh, and we added for the next four years after that a 2% bump each year. Uh, that uh, is for raises or uh, pharmaceutical expenses or, or expenses rise. Uh, we are very confident uh, as we go forward uh, with uh, the liability uh, because of the better quality of care. That will go down, obviously transportation. And uh, we envision at the end of 2015 to have the 340B pricing, which will cut pharmaceuticals nearly in half. And that'll be a substantial savings to the county and, and to our taxpayers. Uh, so. Uh, with that, uh, we're projecting 17.6 million, uh, million for the budget for Metro over five years. Uh, with the capital built into it, it'll be $18.8 .8 million. That's what we're proposing to council now. Alex, answer any questions. Questions for your chair? Um, yes. Through the chair to um, the sheriff, how much is the $18 million is for set aside for salaries out of that $18 million? Um, 2.6 million a year, approximately, if you add 2% to each year. And this is a five-year contract. Uh, what was the original one for? The original one was, uh, well, we started out with three months uh, as we uh, came out of the gates, and then we made it nine months to finish this year, and now we're proposing a five-year because because uh, it hasn't worked out. It's worked out so well and that we're very confident. It's been a while. What year was that? D just last year. I don't year. think I was on public safety. Yes. No, the three months when we first started this. January 2014. Um, when you have inmates or offenders, I don't, I don't know what the correct terminology is, and they need any kind of dental, because this covers medical, dental, pharmacy, um, if they're already in the realm of getting like some partials or dentures or things of that nature, and then they're released, what, what is our, I mean, does anything ever happen like that? Um, what is our procedures? Well, our, our procedure we've is... we've already spent the money and the person is released. How does that Correct. Work? And Dr. Tolman can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but we, if they've started in a process, we, we uh, uh, point them in the direction of Metro to continue their uh, care. Okay. So we continue. We foot the bill. No, we do not fit the bill once they leave our facility. 
Okay, and so that's where I'm not clear. But if, but if we ordered the partials, so then they would yeah, get them. Yeah, on some dental procedures, you have to pay 50% or something like that. So I'm just wondering, once they release, no more financial, whether it's in the loo or not. That's, that's correct, unless unless we've already ordered it and it came in, and then we'd give it to them. Okay, and also when the when the inmates or the offenders um, are leaving, or for the, I think because there was uh, mental health services as well, during the release, uh, upon their release, are they connected to a facility to continue their their mental health services? Yes, we, we do give them the options where to go. Obviously, we can't force them, but we, we do point them in the directions where they should go. Okay, and so Metro Health is actually giving the mental health services, providing a psychiatrist, is that what you're saying, inside the facilities? Or is just they're just med that's, that's correct. Med Kated. Yes, okay. that's correct. I couldn't remember if she was our employer, Metro Health. But. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Miller. To the sheriff, first I want to commend you for, uh, for this tremendous effort that's going to not only save money but improve health care. And, and my question is, do you have an estimate as to... Uh, how much the cost of health care at, at the jail will be more or less on an annual basis under this program compared to what it was prior to 2014 before we had the uh, contract with Metro? With uh, uh, Chairman to Councilman Miller, um, I would like to come back within another couple months after we have a year under our belt to share our success stories because I would have to build in the transport savings. Uh, once 340, 340B pricing is in place, uh, we, we think there'll be a uh, clear savings. I, I, I'd be uh, misleading anyone if I, if I tried to give you a number now, but we clearly think it's a win for the county and the taxpayers. Okay, well, we'll look to get that number later next year. Thank I will you, provide Mr. it. Chairman. Mr. Chair, that, that pretty much was uh, what my question was going to be because, Sheriff, I was so impressed when we had that tour of the facility and, and uh, actually to see the, the, the patients being worked on and, uh, and the doctor explaining that the, the, the quality of the monitoring is, is superior to even using their own stethoscope. It was just kind of amazing, and, mm -hmm. and everybody that I've been able to talk to about this is, it, it's just phenomenal. And, and the savings in transportation alone and, and the quality of clear, care uh, that these prisoners are getting. Uh, you know, coming down here, I, I pass the, uh, the cold storage that says number one hospital, uh, you know, in the state. You know, We've got to have the number one county jail in the state as far as health care. It's unprecedented. So, uh, you know, congratulations to you and to the doctor and Metro Health. It, it's really a win-win. And I'm, uh, I, I think the, the amount of money that we're going to be saving is, is, is going to be monumental. With better care, less cost, uh, it's a home run. I agree. Thank you. Mr. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to the sheriff, I, I too would just like to congratulate you on the, the great work that you have done. Every time I've reached out, you've been very uh, responsive. And so thank you for that. And regardless of, of whether this tells us we have not saved a tremendous amount of money, I'm glad that we we're able to deliver quality health care to these inmates uh, that we have not been able to do before. So for me, it, it, the, the the savings or whether we uh, exceed what we intended to spend, but it, if, if we exceed that we provide a quality service always makes a difference with me. So I just want to say again, thank you, and I, and I uh, look forward to, to hearing um, after a year about the success of the, uh, the transition. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Greenspan. Thank you. And, and obviously we, we share in, or I share in congratulating you as well. The 340B pricing, when do you envision that, us being able to take advantage of that opportunity? Uh, it's a pretty arduous pro uh, process, but uh, hopefully we'll realize it in October of 2015. Okay. And, and I believe the numbers we heard there was about a $250,000 savings. That was three years ago, but is that still 
around the ballpark? Roughly, that's about the ballpark. Okay, great. And and to um, not to diminish the work the sheriff's done, but I must say, Councilman Gallagher drove this issue home and has been an advocate for this from day one. So um, he he too deserves in the. Uh, accolades for the success of what is being realized at, at the jail. So I just want to bring that forward as well. Totally agree. Thank you. We, we had a good committee and we stayed together on it and Sheriff, we got it done. So I, I applaud that. Anything further? Just one other <coughs> thought that occurred to me on it, and I don't know if this is crazy or not, but you know, I, I'm thinking of the possibility that in the minds of some of our residents, prisoners, they're better off in our jail than they are on the outside. Um, and I'm just wondering if, uh, if what we've learned here, uh, if possibly we could think in the future as to our homeless shelters of possibly having some type of clinic at our homeless shelters so that if uh, prisoners released in hard times, they don't have to commit a crime to get back into our county jail. Um, it's just a kind of crazy thought that, you know, they're, they're better off in jail than, uh, especially if, if they're unemployed with a record. Uh, Chairman to uh, Councilman Germana, I believe there are uh, uh, mobile clinics that go around, so I, I think that's already in play, but uh, I, I don't know. If, uh, you know, I would have to discuss that with Metro in the future. Okay. Anybody else? Because we only have, uh, I was going to let this go to the full three, but we can't because we only have one meeting in December. So um, I'll accept the motion for resolution 2014-02-88 to the full council under second reading suspension. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Thank you, Sheriff. Sure. Thank you, Council. Thank, uh, thank all of you. It, yeah, if you want to. Janine, you can add everybody's name to this. Okay. Okay. Councilman Germana, I believe uh, Care Alliance, they already do the health care for the homeless. So it's pretty much out there already. We need to get Metro any more business. 0289. Resolution number 2014-0289, a resolution authorizing amendments to contracts with various providers for staff secure shelter care services for the period 3-1-2014 through 2-29-2016 for additional funds, authorizing the county executive to execute the amendments and all other documents consistent with this resolution and declaring the necessity that this resolution become immediately effective. Good afternoon, Karen Lippman with Juvenile Court. We need to get um, you an office over here. Huh, I'm sorry? <laughs> You're here all the time. <laughs> but guys, I miss you guys, you know, and well, I, I, try, I try to find there, excuses to come. You got your big come. lie of the day out of the way. Go <laughs> ahead. <now. laughs> I never lie. I like telling stories, but I don't lie. Um, what we have today is an amendment to our two shelter care agreements. Um, this is adding our uh, next year's funds in place. Um, we have three funding sources that pay for shelter care. We have our general fund, uh, Reclaim Ohio funds, and our Title IV-E funds. Um, our two providers are Carrington Youth Academy and Cleveland Christian Home. And um, this is Staff Secure Shelter Care, which relieves our detention center population. Right. Questions? Mr. Here. Chair. Um, Carrington Youth Academy sits in uh, between East Cleveland and Cleveland Heights, and I had the privilege over the summer to be invited over to Carrington Youth Academy to tour the facility, kind of hear about what they do. And when I tell you, because I, I, I drive past there all the time, I never knew what they did. It's just a nice building that sits on the, on the main road, and I'm like, okay, what do they do? So when I got the call to come visit, uh, we, inside, it, it's like, I want to say the Taj Mahal, but it, it, it is beautiful. And the staff is friendly. The, and we, I got a chance to meet some of the youth, and they just seemed like they really, in, not really enjoyed being there, but they, they were comfortable uh, while they were, were housed at the facility. And they, uh, I can't say enough how, how much of a, a success they have been, not only for the, for the young people that, that reside there, but for that general community as well. Yes, ma'am. Through the councilman, uh, why isn't this contract uh, 
lining up with our biennial budget? Um, well, the, the, we did an RFP a year ago, and so the start date was March 1st on that. Um, it, it, to be honest, it doesn't line up because, because of the way that, that the budget closes down. It sometimes becomes then difficult for us to, um, to have services which are continual that then end at the end of the calendar year. So we, we try actually some of our contracts we try to offset because it's actually easier. This contract actually also includes Reclaim Ohio funds which are on a state fiscal year anyways. So um, the two funding sources that do feed into this are on different fiscal years. Okay, I have a couple other questions. These, these contract amounts include what for the youth? Uh, medical, dental? What no, exactly? it does not include any of that. It includes... It's just the shelter? It is just the shelter. It is the, it is the um, housing room and board, essentially. There's no services involved. These houses, <laughs> th these youth are, are simply held so that they can attend their next court hearing. And who provides for the med the, their other services? The um, parents, they're still under the custody of their parents. parents, so if they need any kind of medical, that, that goes back to the parents. Okay. Uh, are these uh, secure facilities? They're what we call staff secure, which means they are not locked facilities, and um, um, the doors may be locked, but they may have crash bars, what we call crash bars, so that they can be opened, so that if a youth chooses to leave, they can leave. Um, staff can't put their hands, cannot put their hands on youth. They can, they can talk to a youth, um, and and try to um, have them consider staying. But these are in place of detention instead of the youth going to a detention home, correct? Correct. These are these are youth that um, need a place to stay that is not the home, but they but. Um, a secure detention facility is really not the appropriate setting for them. So if the youth does leave, what happens? They are considered AWOL, um, and they're in um, violation of their detention um, because they have to be um, remanded to that facility. Uh, and uh, parents are notified. Uh, Usually when they when they walk out, if they do walk out, they show up within 24 hours. Okay. Sometimes so they go home. it necessarily mean that they go back, um, they've committed a wall and they go to a detention center after that. You work with the youth and the... the no, if, if, they, if they do leave and then they're either picked up by the police or, or come in voluntarily, they'll go back for another hearing and the jurist will decide, okay, we're going to send you back to detention or we're going to do something different. Um, depending on what the situation is. And what is the uh, breakdown percentage for each fund that each fund puts into this project? Um, I don't have the, you mean uh, for the, each of the funding the, sources? Yeah, yes, ma'am. I don't have it broken down by percentages. I can tell you the totals for okay. each of the, of go, the, go right ahead. so the, um, the general fund uh, is $1,352,851.30, and that's been the same amount that general fund has put into shelter care for a long time, a that's number 1. of years. 1.3, 1, 1. 1352. Mm -hmm. um, our reclaim funds are $690,000, and then our Title IV-E funds are going to be about $460,000. And I believe my last question, um, could you explain why there's an in increase of almost 400000 is from the original contract? Last year's contract was $400,000 less. For the, the calendar year? Mm -hmm. the, um, right now, we have a total number of beds of four. Carrington Youth Academy allows us for 35 beds and Cleveland Christian Home allows for uh, 10 beds. So we have 45 beds. Um, so some of it depends on um, bed usage uh, and what we use. We did have a period of time, I'm trying to remember if it was the beginning of last year, where we actually didn't even need all of the beds. I'm trying to remember back. Um, but um, each of the facilities did get a, a short, a small unit rate 
hike, per diem rate hike. Um, so that may have something to do with the amount. I don't have the last year's documents in front of me, so I can't speak to. And, and so they must charge uh, the Cleveland Christian Home versus the Carrington Youth Academy probably have different costs? They're, well, the new costs are within six cents of each other for a per diem. So they're, they're almost identical. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Anyone else? Then Mr. Miller, then Mr. Greenspan. Ms. Lippman, uh, how is this contract uh, similar or different from the uh, the five hundred thousand dollars for the shoulder care pilot that that's requested for the twenty fifteen budget update? Sure. The the pilot that we are um, proposing is going to be a secure facility. So that so while these are what we call staff secure, that is going to be a secure facility, meaning the doors will be locked. Um, so that's the one difference. Um, the, um, the, that facility is really looking at youth who need that locked facility, but secure detention is really is too much, is, is more than they need, um, as well as a lot of the youth that need that secure facility. They may be the youth that have gone AWOL, that have run away, um, have violated probation, um, you know, or violated terms of home detention and need a secure place to stay where they can't leave, um, but they may be misdemeanants um, or lower level offenders or uh, at a lower risk level. And um, best practice states that you really shouldn't put the low risk youth with the high risk youth. We have so many high risk youth that are now in secure detention um, based on all of the stuff that you've heard about the gangs and the over 18 year olds, the House Bill or Senate Bill 337 youth and all of that, that it becomes, so even if there are beds available in the secure detention center, it's really not the best place for these youth. It's it really, um, uh, what research shows is that when you put these misdemeanors in with those youth, that they actually then commit more serious crimes. So we don't want that to happen. So that's why the pilot sort of comes into play. So it's a secured facility with locked doors, um, that's really going to focus on youth that need that secured facility, but they don't have, they're not the same high risk youth and they're not, not the felons and not the same youth that we are currently seeing in our detention center. Mr. Chairman, follow up. Ms. Ms. Lippman, uh, presuming that there's a, a certain pool of youth out there that are going to need to be served in, in 2015, if we, uh, if we invest $500,000 in the sure, secure pilot su serving a group of that youth, uh, why would that not enable you to save $500,000 someplace else because they wouldn't go to some other facility, either less or more restrictive? It's really about finding the place that's best for the youth, that serves, that's the least restrictive but the safest for the community and for the youth. So um, while there are, there's this, and, and the pilot project, we're really looking at maybe 10 beds, probably less than that. So the, while there's this group of youth who are really, it's not appropriate for them to be in secure detention with the over 18 year olds, with the felons and all of those gang youth, um, they do need that secure facility so that they don't continually run away or they don't continually um, um, get into fights or whatever with the youth that are in the, the staff secure shelter care. So, um, but at the same time, it doesn't mean if we have, let's say that pilot allows for 10 beds, which I think it's actually going to be less than that. Um, it doesn't mean that you're going to fill those beds all the time. It's it's really about whatever youth come to um, to the attention of the court and finding the best, least restrictive place for them. So, uh, you know, if a youth can be successful just going home and being supervised by their parent prior to their adjudication, that's always the first option. Um, if they need just a home detention um, or home detention with electronic monitoring that would be sort of the next step up. So we have a whole continuum of services within detention, and we, we um, seek through, through the hearing, the jurist seeks to find the least restrictive setting, which is going to keep the youth safe um, and is going to be most appropriate for them. So it's, 
um, you know, you can presume that, that maybe you won't need as many staff secure beds or maybe the tension population will go down um, or some of these other things, but you really don't know because you don't know what your array of youth are going to be at any given time. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm just wondering, do you have what the the cost of this is per per day versus the cost of uh, our own? What it, uh, or, or do you are you uh, able to? Uh, I don't want to say, come up with a, a cost for staying in the detention center. Many have tried. <laughs> it becomes really difficult to, to really sort of ferret out what secure <coughs> detention costs because you have to, it's not just about, um, you know, your food and, and your staff, but it's also sort of the space and, and everything else. Um, it's probably, you know, um, several hundred dollars a day is, is my guess. Um, I mean, it depends on what your population is. There's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, I can tell you our staff secure shelter is um, right about 158 a day. So it, it's definitely cheaper than, than um, the secure detention facility. Um, you know, um, I, I think there have been a number of attempts um, to sort of ferret out what it costs in secure detention per day. But you would have to, you know, take the part of the space of the juvenile justice center that's just detention, and exactly. it, there's a, so many components. It would be, it would take a huge amount of time. I guess my my last question is: this is room and board? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Greenspan. Thank you. This amount being these amounts being requested are these for 2015 and two months in the 16, or is this going back to March of 14? The, the, this is an amendment to a contract that started March of 14. So these are the dollar amounts. So that was, those amounts were for 12 months. So those go until February 28th of 15. So the, um, the reclaim funds that are on here started, that grant year started July 1st of 14. The general fund and um, Title IV-E funds are 2015 funds. So, in And order they will go then until February 29th of 16. So, so it's basically from today, so to speak, until, the, until February, 20, uh, February 29th of 16. It, yes. It, it, this is an amendment. So these are the second-year dollars. Okay. So we did a two-year contract, but we only put the first-year dollars in. Okay. But you're crossing over to... You're actually crossing over not only two fiscal years, but two budget years as, as well. We are, but then it, it's sort of the next set of contracts will start March 1st of 16. Those will be $16. We won't be touching the $2016 until that new contract mm -hmm. comes into play. And, and okay, thank you for answering those questions. Just I, so, so we know it costs one fifty eight for staff secure in an external... Mm -hmm. facility but we don't know we know from we know the Euclid jail is around $55 a day we know that the county jail is 85 to 87 a day are you saying we do not know what our juvenile jail per bed night rate is no I mean we have some folks have done some calculations um, but there there's no definitive number that we could say this is what it costs. And and how many, you might not know the answer to this off the top of your head, but of those that are currently in the juvenile detention center, are there any there that would be eligible for an, a staff secure facility? Or are they all there because they need to be there because of the... Pretty much they're all there because they need to be there. So what they do um, every day in population management is they look at sort of the new youth that have come in and if there's a number of youth who really shouldn't be in the detention center that need to be in 
the shelter care facility, then they look at the population of shelter care, see who's getting out there, and they so it's a daily okay. shuffle so that they're always moving youth down the continuum. So maybe a youth is at staff care shelter for a few days, and then they're ready to move maybe to home detention so they can move down the continuum to a more least, a, a less restrictive placement, and then you can move youth from detention down the continuum. And this half million dollar contract or amendment, the the pilot, the pilot. Mm -hmm. What's the cost per person per night? The, the, what's the, the there's a the sheriff sheriff. What's that term per per in my per diem the per, per diem the per, the per diem. What's the I thought we, it was different. to be honest, we don't we don't know the per diem of the pilot project yet because we still would we would have to do an RFP and see what kind what came okay. back. Let, let me ask this. And, and it would I'm, be more than the staff secure, though. Yeah, I would imagine that. But, you know, what, what we don't yet, yet know is cost effectiveness of the program compared to our own facility, even though there might be some overcrowding issues with our own facility. So I would ask that in tandem, to, as that number is being developed, that we mm -hmm. get a better handle on what it costs to house our own deten detainees in our own facility versus the, the, uh, versus the outplaced facility is that possible in the next time period to have that done sure we can we could we could ferret it out because it may be more cost can. effective for us to to outplace these folks as opposed to housing them ourselves or domiciling them ourselves it may be it, right. it and it then becomes an issue of right is there but a we, facility we, that would take them right but we need to know that i, I, mm -hmm. I guess is my point so if you could obviously the staff secure is one level of, mm -hmm. of detainment. But obviously, if we're talking about in-house or out-house, out-of-house facility for the same type of detainment, we should know the cost-benefit analysis between the two. Okay. So if you can provide analysis to that. Can do. Thank you. Anything further? I think we have a long way to go on this uh, pilot project. There's a lot of concerns out there. Because I, th I personally think either you belong in jail or you don't belong in jail, and that we in, in society start expanding to either the black and white to gray, and now we're expanding the gray. And we have what I consider a solution in the ankle bracelets, which has the perpetrator's parents paying for it, as opposed to the taxpayers. So unless there's a doggone good reason they shouldn't be in jail, then they should be out of jail. And we should stop being social workers with the criminal element of Cuyahoga County, regardless of age. But that's my opinion. So, any other questions regarding this? Ma'am? Uh, through the chair, and, and that was kind of, I, I agree with Green, uh, Councilman Gallagher. What is, what is aptly happening to the youth now that aren't in this, and I'm not the secure shelter, but the new pilot program? Well, that we haven't started that yet. Right. But so what is what is that oh, terminology? Where, where called? are those youth now? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So that population that we're targeting, what are they doing now? Mm -hmm. Some of them are in staff secure shelters. Some of them are in detention center. So some of them may be on home detention. There's some place in the continuum. Um, we're fortunate that we have we have a lot of different. Um, um, Options along the continuum, including what I didn't mention was was our day report center, our place and planning day report center, which has, um, which is a day reporting center for youth that um, that they go six days a week. And then um, that's kind of what uh, Councilman Gallagher was alluding to, and I I was alluding to. They're, they're housed in one of the facilities. Uh, either the judge or the social worker determined. Just the judge. The only a judge can determine which facility that they need to go to. So, and I. It's been a while, so I don't remember back to when you, pr did you present for the pilot program at the first budget meeting? I, I, we, we discussed it briefly, and then we had a fire alarm. That's maybe what, <laughs> what was the issue, because I just don't really remember it and why we're creating this, this third and it, and, it, and a lot of it has to do with sort of the most appropriate setting for youth, is that we, we really want these youth not to learn how to be better criminals. We want them to learn how to be successful in society and but in the community. But then the judge would, if, if that's the case with an individual, then the judge would put them in the secure shelter facility versus the detention right. center. So um, 
but if, if they continue to run from something that's staff secure, that we need a secure setting for them. Um, you know, while we, we don't want them to be in secure detention and learn how to be better criminals, we, um, we also, and we want them to be successful in society, we um, want them to have sanctions for breaking the rules at the same time. But, so you really have to balance all of those pieces. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Miller. So everybody knows that the shelter pilot is going to be discussed in the next hour, and, and, and uh, we're going to have to make a decision on it. So uh, come back. Okay. <clears throat> Nothing further, 2014. That includes Ms. Lippman. 0289. Uh, I would assume you'd want to move this forward considering dates. Yeah, you know what? We're, we, we always try to keep things way in advance, so this is a March 1st start, so... So we'll just send it to the full council for second reading. So moved. Second. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Against? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Who made the first and the second? Uh, Mr. Greens or Mr. Germana, Germana Greenspan, and <laughs> and Greenspan. Thank you. Uh, is there uh, any public comment? No, Mr. Chair. No one assigned. Miscellaneous business. Take a break. See you in about 40 minutes.